Hi, brothers and sisters. Jerry O'Donnell here with Four Angels Messages. Uh, we had a comment in a previous uh, video that asked, what is the position that I have regarding the Trinity? And so I was going to address that. We already addressed the Holy Spirit a number of years ago, about three years or so ago. Uh, and now what we're going to do is actually incorporate that with the Godhead because that subject matter is connected. Uh, it seems that there is an, an aggressive push these days about that position. I do have a social media uh, minor presence or a minor social media presence, including Facebook. I only use it for hit and run. What I mean by that is that in the morning I will post a Bible verse and comment. In the afternoon I will come up with a religious thought and then in the evening I will also post a Bible verse and a comment. Usually it's the Old Testament in the morning, New Testament in the evening. But uh, between that and YouTube, that's basically all I have. Yes, the, the Converting of the Soul is another Facebook page of, of mine as well. And uh, with that in mind, I have been inundated, not personally, this was the first one personally, by the way, that came in on YouTube. But I have seen post after post, at least uh, on a daily basis, sometimes several times a day, arguing about the position of either the Holy Spirit, uh, the Trinity, uh, false gods, the, uh, Catholicism creeping in or present, all these things. And so I have put together a message that I hope is solid. Um, I know I'm not going to change anybody's mind, uh, uh, but it's information that's being put out. And, and I don't mean to already put down the message. It seems that those that are on the push have their minds made up and there is not going to be any form of adjusting that. Uh, I, I've gotten into arguments many a time. In fact, I've already addressed the Godhead uh, a couple summers ago during a camp meeting uh, in Alabama. And yet here we are still because they don't read anything. They don't listen to any other sermons. They just put things out there. I responded, by the way, with a preview of some Bible verses that I find very revealing that are ignored usually. And that's what's going to be accused of, of mine, so don't be surprised if there's some negative comments out of this. So, with that in mind, let us be in the right spirit to open up our Bibles and study it and get it from God's Word. Hopefully, it will have a positive effect, especially on those that may be a little misunderstood misunderstanding this topic that is let's pray our father thank you so very much for this time to spend with you we pray for your holy spirit to guide us because that's exactly what the bible teaches i'm just quoting scripture and that's what we're supposed to use in praying uh spiritual things to a spiritual being and only spiritual things are spiritually discerned we are to be guided in truth and to be able to rightly divide thy word. That means to open it up and understand it. And so with that in mind, may you help us now to understand these things, have an open mind, and endure to the end, and put it all together, and let the conclusion speak for itself. We pray that you speak to our hearts, and may thy truth triumph. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, I entitled this message actually the Godhead because that is a biblical term uh, that is used, and I'm going to read all three references. 
first let's go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, and I'm only going to use the method of study that I'm familiar with out of Isaiah 28, 9, and 10. Who's going to find the doctrine on this subject? Who's going to gain the knowledge thereof? Line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here little and there little. Let's search the Bible out so there will be a lot of moving around here. So we start with Acts 17, verse 29. The Bible says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Now, first off, seeing that the word Godhead here uh, uh, is applicable, or is biblical, is used, I want to start off with a question already, and I've only read one verse as opposed to all three. And that is, if there is a Godhead, doesn't that then mean that there is more than one being that makes up the Godhead? Uh, you know, I have run and technically am still in business, and I'm not talking about on the religious side, uh, a computer business, and I am known as... Uh, the owner or sometimes referred to as the president of the company, but it's a little boring when there is nobody else in the company. Um, it's hard to be the head of something if you're the only one involved. So if there is only one being known as God, which obviously according to the Jehovah Witness, uh, they don't even believe Jesus is God, so therefore they only believe that, as is referred to as the Father, He's the only one that is God, and if you're God, then why would you be referred to as the Godhead? Uh, it doesn't make sense. It, it takes a multitude to, to be uh, that. It's one thing to be the head of engineering, being the sole person, but when you say you are the Godhead, you, that means there's something you're, you're in charge of, uh, the main figure of. Let's get more on this. Romans chapter 1. And as I have put this together, there's going to be more things that come to mind than uh, I planned for. For instance, that whole discussion just a moment ago. It just raised a question, why would you re reference yourself a Godhead if you're not, that there's not something part of the department, in other words? I'm still stuck on that. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by all things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. It sounds like more of a title than a reference to, well, when we say God, it's just a shortened version of Godhead. Why would you be called a Godhead uh, if God is just sufficient? So again, I say to, to us as we study these things out, let's make sure we understand these terms properly. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians is our next stop. Over here in Colossians chapter 2. And this is the third reference to Godhead. Colossians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Okay, so let's pause already. On this subject matter, there's a lot of philosophy that's involved and a lot of arguments that are made that are just absolutely vain, and we're going to address some of those, by the way. And it's all a deceit. And then we go, and after the tradition of men, and for those that believe in a three-headed Godhead, there is the topic of, isn't it by tradition? And we don't want to be following tradition, especially as the Catholic Church is uh, based upon traditions of men. 
and not after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So Christ is our centered figure. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, wait a second. If all the Godhead is in Jesus Christ, that makes him part of the, uh, I'm just going to be direct with it, pluralistic aspect of God. In other words, there is God the Father that we all recognize. And then there now we just read here that in Jesus is the fulfillment uh, or the f uh, fulfilling of um, let's get the the word actually correct here in in what we just read here in verse nine. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. He is fully the Godhead. Part of it, at least. Again, you, it's hard to be declaring yourself to be present and head of something if there's nothing to. Well, head or rule over. So, therefore, we have at least two beings that are recognized as part of the Godhead. That's what that scripture just revealed. Now, for those that say already I'm in disagreement, please hold on and continue on with the rest of the message. So, let me share with you the Bible, all the Bible verses that speak about the Trinity now. Let's go. And we're done. There is none. Now, some people have argued and says the word Trinity is just a number and uh, we should freely use it in exchange or in uh, conversation and there is nothing wrong with using that word. Well, let me pose something else to you. Uh, when I was growing up, I w was teased, uh, but was not part of this, basically, because I was not your typical little boy that was uh, sex-crazed. Uh, I was told then, since I'm not active in that, I must be gay. And I told people that, I, you know, I'm... I hate when uh, uh, that coming up, and so I thought I would head it off or rebut with something and say when they do that. And uh, so when that subject matter came up, I would say, oh, absolutely, I'm a very happy person, and then walk away. Today, I wouldn't use that at all because it is well grounded and it has, despite that being a perfect definition, being happy, it carries a lot of negative aspect, especially in Christianity, uh, using the Bible that is. And so therefore, I would not proudly be saying that. Um, there are other uh, terms as well that people will refrain from using because of the negative connotations thereof. And so what I'm getting at is to say the word Trinity is automatically uh, linked with Catholicism so much so that that's what comes to, to mind. It's equated with it. So I would not do disrespect. Everything is lawful to me, according to Paul. But I refrain from those things that will, well, have that negative impact upon God. So yes, I can say the word Trinity if I want to, but since it has such a pagan connection, I refrain from using that. So I will not use that. And if it comes up in conversation and someone is freely using it, I will always use on my side of the conversation, Godhead. Now, when it comes to the Godhead in Trinity, are we just saying that there is a difference of terminology here? So basically you believe in the same thing, but you don't use the word Trinity, you use Godhead and it's just a matter of what word you use. Absolutely, positively not. And here is where those that push that uh, a three-headed Godhead uh, is absolutely uh, pagan and uh, and it's not true because what it happens to be is that they do not understand 
how the Catholic Church and paganism actually uses Trinity to describe what they, they, they have. For instance, there is the, uh, what is it, a three-headed dog or something like that. Uh, it's one body, three different heads. They're connected. So more specifically, as a, once a faithful Catholic, there is only one being of God. That's it. Then came upon a time in which it was time for, well, Jesus to walk the face of this earth. And so somehow he separated himself and that entered into Mary and was born and then is now God, if you, you would. And then, of course, we have uh, the breath of God, and that's the Holy Spirit, but it's all God. So there is only one being called God, and there's these three different representations thereof, and that is the Catholic understanding. As opposed to what we see here described in the Bible and yet to be unfolded, so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So let us be careful already that I don't get mislabeled as just changing a word from Trinity to Godhead. Big deal. No, there is a whole different concept behind the word Trinity as opposed to distinct beings being Godhead. And we have established that uh, the Father, not so much so just yet, but it's understood, is God. And Jesus is part of the Godhead. That is clear. We at least have that two positions. So let us continue on then and see how many gods there really are. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And let's take a look here in verse 6. The Bible says here, But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Now, we already established Jesus is part of the Godhead, and what has just been established here is that there is one God, and that's the Father. So now, what, what do we have going on? You can't be part of the Godhead without being a God. So Jesus Christ and the Father have been established as being, uh, well, the, that makes up the Godhead. They're both God. Let's go to Mark chapter 12 to get more on this. Mark chapter 12. And let's take a look here at verse 29. The Bible says here, And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, keep in mind the word Lord, okay? Uh, that's very important. So, Jesus, being in the human flesh, but also having the fullness of the Godhead in him, recognizes the Father as God. So that's clear. Now, with that in mind, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and answer this question. Just how many fathers do we have? Um, which Ephesians doesn't actually answer it uh, as uh, I, it comes to mind here because of another verse that we'll eventually read. But nonetheless, let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. The Bible says here, There is one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. See, the Father is referred to as God in both cases. And there is, well, it says one God and Father. It didn't say that there's just one God. At the same time, they are not 
at odds competing with each other. Now, what happens that complicates this is when you read the scriptures and you see the word God, the name God, splattered throughout, and that's all you have. There is an assumption there in many of those cases to be referring to none other than the Father. And so we need to be very slow in reading the context thereof to see what the verse is really sharing. But be careful, again, reading more into what we have here. So who is God? And on this, I am going to read a quite a few verses. Let's go to Philippians. And all I am doing is actually reading and asking questions for the most part. Philippians chapter 2 is where we're headed. And verse 11, the Bible says here in Philippians 2, 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now remember what Jesus said. There is uh, one God our Lord, okay, to the glory of God the Father. So we see here that Lord and is associated, but remember that Jesus Christ is also Lord. Isaiah chapter 9, let's go there. Let's get some Old Testament scripture as well. I'm not afraid to use that. We shouldn't be because we're whole Bible people. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, the Bible says to us, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and the name call, shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father even, the Prince of Peace. These are all titles associated with Jesus. So even Jesus himself is known as the Father. But he is also the mighty God. And he cannot be praying unto God the Father if he was just praying to himself because it's a form of schizophrenic then. What we have here is that they are two separate beings having both titles. They are separate beings, hence the term Godhead, or there would be no use of it. Let's get more. Matthew chapter 4. This is all based on the same question that I just asked. In Matthew chapter 4, let's read here in verse 7. In Matthew 4, verse 7, the Bible says here, Jesus said unto him, it is a written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. What's going on here? The devil's tempting Jesus. And when you're tempting Jesus, it's, he, Jesus just stated that you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. He admitted that he is God. So you may not tempt Jesus being God. Let's go to Luke chapter 18. So it's clear that we have interchangeable references to both the Father and to Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 18, verse 19, the Bible says, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. He didn't say that he wasn't good. He better be good. He was perfect. He did no sin. Therefore, he is good. That makes him God. That's what Jesus just said here. That is God. God is the one that's good. Let's go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. So these are declarations of Jesus and for anybody to say, oh no, he was just a prophet. I'm sorry. In John 8, we're going to be reading verse 58. Uh, anybody, any human being, if they're just a wonderful teacher, wonderful prophet, and then also take on the titles of God, be very very weary to the point of that's of Satan. Verse 58 again of uh, chapter 8 in John. John 8 58 says, Jesus saying unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. This is when he w was in an argument with the Pharisees and, and he says, I saw Abraham's day. And they say to him, but you're not even 50 years old. How could you have seen his day? And then he declares, 
I am, which is a reference to God. He is declaring he is the I am. So Jesus is the I am. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3, and just to prove that to you, because, well, that's where it comes from. Exodus chapter 3, in discussion with Moses, and Moses is you know, trying to get out of the duty that he's being called to do. He's all fearful, and so he comes up with different ex uh, arguments to try and get out of the situation. And, and finally he says, well, when they ask, then who sent me? And he says in verse 14, Exodus 3, 14, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, uh, Then shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And so we clearly see that Jesus himself has declared that he is the I am. He is God. He is good. Um, all of those things. So what we are establishing here first, before we talk about the number that makes up the Godhead, we're trying to establish clearly that both Jesus and the Father make up the Godhead. Now, when we say that there is one God, how can there, there be two gods? That's because when it says in certain places that there is one God, be very careful not to uh, assume that that was the best word to be placed into that situation. I'm not saying there's an error, but there, sometimes there is heavenly assumption that can be put in there. For instance, God being short for Godhead. That's a possibility. I will let you know that. Because remember, Greek words and even Hebrew words, they have multiple meanings. And I have a little computer program not made by Seventh-day Adventists. I don't care. I don't know what denomination it is. But it, basically, it's a Bible in electronic form. And every word, I'm able to uh, move my little computer mouse to it and click on the, the word and pops up the definition. And I see that it says, this is the Greek word. I don't know what the, it's hard to say the, the word. And here's the Hebrew word and stuff like that. Uh, and then it gives multiple definitions. And I say, oh, OK, so there's the word that you picked out and put into that place. But you could have chosen any of these that kind of give a different understanding to it. So we serve one Godhead is what the implication thereof. But if we even say that there is one God, there is another aspect of hearing that phrase that there is one God. Let us go and take a look at it. Let's go to Genesis, and this is biblical, so you can't argue with me on this one. The last one, yeah, it's still human effort there because even though I assume that the Bible was made, or the uh, Greek words by definition are all given uh, to the best of their ability, there still, I guess, can be human error and leave out a word that it could have been. But here we are in Genesis, and let's start here in chapter 1, verse 26, and it says, And God said, okay, so one being called God, let us make man in our image. Wait a second. You just used two pluralities there, an us and an our. After our likeness, now we're up to three, let them have dominion over the fish, the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. This was not part of the sermon. I'm going to add it anyhow. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created uh, he them. Okay, it's sufficient. Three references that are plural. Us, our, our. You can't get beyond that. You cannot invite someone to create if they don't have creating powers. Oh, come over and watch me, is what you would have said if they are not God. So you got this most holy being that may be above all the angels uh, that you created and you refer to it as your son. You wouldn't say, let us create. You would say, Come watch me as I create. 
I didn't say Jesus is a created being. Don't, I'm trying to take the argument of those that are against Jesus being God. I don't take that position. I take the fact that both have creative abilities. Both are referred to as the Father. You're not the Father of something if you don't give birth to something, create something. And so, therefore, both Jesus and the Father are both creators. They have the ability to do that. And so when God, as in short for Godhead, that's what I'm trying to suggest here. But if not, it's fine to refer to them as God. Now the question is, is that singular or plural? The use of God. Well, in the context thereof, it's evidently plural because it's using us, our, our. Our it would not be used in the verse. It would be mine if it happens to be, or my, happens to be a singular God. It's a plural God. There are at least, again, two beings that make up the Godhead. Let's move on to chapter 3, verse 22. And now, this is very interesting here. In 3.22 of Genesis, it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, again, plurality, to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. So, again, there is a plurality that we see here has become one of us to know good and evil. God knows the good and the evil. He experienced it, especially with Satan uh, rebelling in heaven. And so that's a reference to that time frame as well, to know good and evil, uh, to witness it, to experience it in that form, uh, uh, that method. Let's go to Genesis chapter 11, just as a third reference. In Genesis chapter 11, let's take a look here. Genesis 11, and let's take a look here in Genesis 11, Verses 6 and 7, the Bible says here, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Verse 7 says, Go to let us, plural, go down, and there confound their language, and they may not understand one another's speech. This is just three examples, and there are quite a few other examples throughout the Bible that there is a plurality to God. We have to conclude, at the very least, that God the Father and Jesus Christ, who is the I Am, happens to be making up the Godhead. They are equal. Now, how can there be a plurality to the one God? other than the fact that I suggest when it says God, it's the implication of Godhead. They make up the Godhead. And we know they make up the Godhead because we saw in Colossians 2, 8, 9 that Jesus definitely is part of the Godhead. So let's go there uh, to John chapter 17 and see by Jesus' own words how they can be one and this is what gets the anti-Trinitarians uh, or anti- or Jehovah Witness basically all worked up. They take that word one and mean and think that it means a number as well. In John 17 22 the Bible says and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. In total agreement in action in thought they are one and that is how we serve one God unlike a child who says to their mommy can I go out and play no it's too wet outside and the child says, oh I really want to go out and play let me go ask dad dad can I go out and play sure son go ahead um, and they're not one on that unlike certain situations here on earth that parents are nece not necessary, even though they try to be one, they are not in total agreement. 
unlike that, the Godhead is in total agreement. You go to Jesus, you're going to get the same answer that the Father would give. Now remember, we don't go to the Father only but through Jesus Christ. So we have to go through Jesus Christ to get to the Father, hence why it is in one agreement. You know, sin cut us off from the Father. So the God of the Old Testament is not God the Father. It is none other than Jesus Christ. He's the mediator between God and man and was so immediately when Adam and Eve sinned. As soon as they sin, God the Father cannot stand sin. Neither does the Son, technically. But he, God the Father, would have nothing to do with the human race then. They were ready to be obliterated. In other words, hellfire was ready to come down on Adam and Eve. But because he also loved the human race, between the Father and the Son, before they sinned, had some type of meeting, council, just the two of them, to work things out, and after a bit of anguish, it was finally settled that Jesus, part of the Godhead, would come down here and submit to the cross to save the human race. And it pleased the Father, giving you more scripture. In other words, it's satisfied. This is how we are going to be able to dwell with the Father. Because as we are walking around on the new earth, He's going to see that we are there because of Jesus. Now, speaking of which, this is where, as we change a little bit in subject, transition into it, the question I have for you is just how many mediators do we have? Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, let's take a look here at verse 5. The Bible says here, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That is clear, absolutely positively clear that there is but one mediator. And so to think that the Holy Spirit is actually a separate being that works upon our hearts, that draws us unto the, to the Father, how can that exist then since there is only one mediator? Well, in all honesty, I don't find anywhere in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit is a mediator. Well, you just described, Jerry, that all the activity that the Holy Spirit does and it has to be the Spirit of Jesus or the Spirit of the Father because otherwise we now have another mediator. No, I didn't say that. What we have here is called an intercessor. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. There's a difference between mediator and intercessor. Romans chapter 8. Let's get our Bible definitions. No, I'm in total agreement. There is no Holy Spirit that is a mediator. Jesus is the only mediator. Romans 8, 26 and uh, 27. Romans 8, 26, 27. Likewise, the Spirit also uh, helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray, for as we ought, the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with the groanings which cannot be uttered. And that searches the hearts, knoweth that what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So we see here that the Spirit acts in the will of God, makes intercession, and I don't know of a breath that can do that, by the way, especially with groanings. Anyways, we'll get more on this later. Uh, but nonetheless, it the Holy Spirit helps us to understand what to pray for as well. But it's intercessor. Let's get more. 
chapter 8, verse 34. You're right there. Verse 34, the Bible says, Who is that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also make intercession for us. Go to the dictionary. Find out the word mediator. Find out the word intercessor. They are totally different words. Let's go to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, verses 2 and 3. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What he not what the scripture saith of Elias, how the, he make intercession to God against Israel, crying, Lord, they have killed the prophets and dig down th thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Wait a second. I, I don't see anything about the Holy Spirit. No, you don't. What you see here is Elijah is an intercessor. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. So human beings can be intercessors. So I have no problem with the Holy Spirit being a another being that does intercession. I have a problem if he uh, would be the intercessor because there is only one, I'm sorry, a uh, uh, problem if he's the mediator because there is only one mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says here, exhort thy... Therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We're all to be intercessors. It's not just for a prophet to be an intercessor, a mouthpiece of God. We're all supposed to be. Hebrews chapter 7. Let's go there. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. The Bible says, Wherefore he is able to also to save them to the uttermost that cometh unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Well, wait a second. God himself can be an intercessor for that matter. Intercessor is just a, a prompting to live in obedience uh, to do the will of God, uh, to be praying in their absence. You know, oh, I can't do anything with my children. They are so disobedient. I'm going to go to God in prayer and pray day after day after day, week after week after week, uh, month after month after month, year after year after year. Someone said that they prayed over 30 years for their child to come to the, to the Lord and uh, on their deathbed, they did. Not the child, the parent. It took a lifetime, basically, of praying. That was intercession. And we are not forbidden to do that. So, how is the Spirit connected to God? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis 6, let's take a look here at verse 3. The Bible says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. Now, this is a different spirit. This is not the Holy Spirit. It says here that God, in his spirit, uh, it shall not strive with, with man. Um, it's more of who we are in that case. And that is where the anti-Trinitarians uh, get their ammo and says, uh, search the scriptures. Whenever God says about the spirit, it's his spirit and my spirit and, and things like that. You're right. And that's not the Holy Spirit. Watch the context of the verse to figure it out. Let's, let's get more on this. Psalms 31. I have a lot of verses, and I'm running out of a lot of time here. Psalms 31. Let's take a look here at verse 5. The Bible says here, Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. So even Jesus has a spirit. It's who he is. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Let's go there now. I, I like getting lots of verses. I'm sorry that, you know, 
to cause so much exercise in, uh, upon your hands to keep searching the scriptures, but that's the only way we're going to get the answer because I'm not going to give you 10 splattering verses and then uh, expound on them. This is what we need to do is search the scriptures to get the idea here of what God is trying to tell us. For Proverbs 123, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. And so, again, that context simply tells me that not necessarily is that the Holy Spirit, just a spirit of sorts. And uh, before you're saying, now I'm getting totally confused, go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 42. What I'm trying to tell you is that there are, when the word spirit is used, there are multiple uh, purposes. One of these methods happens to be, well, it's equated with the breath of life. You, you ever heard the verse that says, my, the spirit is in my nostril, yea, the breath is in my nose, basically? Um, so, here we are in Isaiah. Uh, let's take a, a look here. In chapter 42, verse 1, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in, uh, in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment into the, unto the Gentiles. And so the spirit here again is generic as in it's one's personality. Um, in other words, the spirit of some of the motivation. I want to save these people. I'm going to put this same motivation in what was just described here. Let's continue on. Let's get more. Ezekiel 36. That's the only way that we are going to clear this subject up is lots of verses. Ezekiel 36 now. Ezekiel 36. It says here in Ezekiel chapter 36, and let's look here at verse 27. The Bible says here, And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. God is a God of, well, obedience himself, walking in the statutes, even his commandments, and he's going to put that motivation in us as well. Let's look at Joel, Joel chapter 2. And Joel chapter 2, let's take a look here at chapter 2, verse 28. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass, after word, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Not necessarily the Holy Spirit, but His Spirit to be able to do these things. Again, a type of motivation. Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. The Bible says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by my by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts it's a very strong spirit but the problem is is that there's a mix up here every time we see the word spirit we think Holy Spirit and from the activity of it it sounds like it's inside God no that's the problem and every time we see spirit referring to a third person that's a problem too it's on both sides so we need to be very careful let's go to Acts chapter 2 now Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, all we're establishing here is that there are verses throughout the Bible that does not necessarily refer to the Holy Spirit. And uh, we need to be very careful because when you do, it causes confusion and people say, aha, see, it cannot be a third person. That's because you took it out of the context. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. The Bible says here, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men dream dreams, or see visions, I'm sorry, and your old men dream dreams. And on my servant and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, 
and they shall prophesy. And by the way, I have no problem with the Holy Spirit referring, being referred to as my spirit. Uh, for instance, Jesus is my son, from the Father's perspective, that is. Okay, so when God the Father says, well, I, I, uh, in whom I am well pleased, this is my beloved son. It just shows that that's part of the family of the Godhead. Um, now, so that's what happens is the confusion thereof. Now, another thing, though, is that a lot of people say, well, the Holy Spirit and Jesus are one and the same. And I'm about to tell you, it cannot be. Despite what black and white we may read, it is not the same th per person. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 12, and this is uh, what we have here. Matthew chapter 12. Let's go there. Matthew 12, verses uh, 15 to 18. Matthew 12, 15 to 18. Because a lot of people say, well, well, well I, I've read that uh, the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ. You may have read that. I'm not going to argue that. Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 to 18. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they could not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of, by Isaiah the prophet saying behold my servant in whom I have chosen <clears throat> my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles so now it looks like the spirit is part of God the Father not Jesus because it God the Father put his spirit upon Jesus but again let's go and establish that Jesus has the Spirit. So let's go to Luke chapter 23 and verse 46. Luke chapter 23 and verse 46. The Bible says, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. So even the ghost is there. Gave up his breath. Gave up his will, if you would. Let's go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, verse 59. In Acts chapter 7, verse 59, the Bible says, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I threw that verse in there to show that everyone has a spirit. It's who we are. It's not the spirit that goes floating off when we die. It is who we are. We have a body physically. We have the breath of life, which is a type of, again, referred to as the spirit. But that does nothing. All of our decision making, we become a living soul, so we don't have a soul, but we have a spirit. And that is who we are. What is our personality? What are our motivations? What are our desires? What are our goals? That is who we are. And when we die, that dies as well. That's how Jesus could say on the cross, I commend my spirit. I give it up. I'm going to be dead. He has none left. Okay, so with that, don't human beings also have a spirit? I just established that. But let's go to Job chapter 7. Job chapter 7. And we're going to get, again, a lot of verses on this one now. Job chapter 7. And take a look here at verse 11. The Bible says here, Therefore I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Job has a spirit. 
Let's take a look here at Psalms 31, verse 5. Guess who else has a spirit? You guessed it. Into thine hand I commend my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Yes, that's a reference to Jesus Christ, but the Psalms are also written from the perspective of David. Continuing on, let's go to Psalm 77. Just in case you didn't get all of that, 77. And let's take a look here at verse 3. The Bible says, I remember God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. That's David clearly, or whoever wrote that particular psalm. David didn't write all the psalms. Let's go to Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26, verse 9. The Bible says here, With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within we will, uh, within me will I seek thee early. For when the judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So Isaiah has a, a spirit. So it is not. Anytime God says, my spirit, my spirit, my spirit. Yeah, he has a spirit. It's who he is. That's why I'm establishing this, because we all have a spirit. It's not necessarily the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And take a look here in Daniel 2, verse 3. The Bible says here in Daniel 2, 3, And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Even Nebuchadnezzar, I'm not of God at this point. He is a pagan. He has a spirit. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke 1, 46 to 47. So all the verses that say that when God speaks, my spirit, ours, uh, the spirit, uh, let's see, is not necessarily, oops, yeah, 46, uh, Luke 1, 46 to 47, sorry, uh, is not necessarily the Holy Spirit. It is truly his spirit. And Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. Verse 47 of chapter 1 in Luke. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Mary had the spirit. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. For the most part, you know, we get closer to the end of my list because I try to do in sequential order. Chapter 1, verse 9. Romans chapter 1. Verse 9. So we have to separate that, that where it says, my spirit, that's not referring to the Holy Spirit necessarily. For Romans 1, 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve, with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Paul had a spirit. 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. And let's look here at verse 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So clearly, clearly the word spirit is a reference to something that we have, even God has, that is who we are. That is what was trying to be established there. Both God and man have the spirit that is separate from referring to the Holy Spirit. So with that in mind, the Holy Spirit, again, cannot be Jesus Christ. Here are two reasons why. Let's go to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Because a lot of people will say that, oh, the Holy Spirit is really Jesus Christ. Oh, really? John chapter 16, verse 13. The Bible says here in John 16, verse 13, Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show it unto uh, you things to come. So, 
the Holy Spirit, when we're prompted, if that's Jesus Christ, he can't say a word because he would be speaking of himself. That's what that says here. He will not speak of himself. That's contradictory. He should have said, when the Spirit guides you in truth, he will be speaking, you will be remembering me or something about himself. But no, he said specifically he will not speak of himself. He, so Jesus cannot speak of himself if it's Jesus. But if it's a separate being, then yes, he can speak, even if it were the Father. Just saying. Then the Holy Spirit can now speak of Jesus Christ, which that is the purpose of uh, the Holy Spirit, to draw us unto Jesus. Let's look at Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 is where we're headed next. In Luke 3, Luke chapter 3, verse 22. The Bible says here in Luke 3, 22, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And the voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Now, if it's Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit, then why is it coming down upon him at his baptism? That does not make sense. Evidently, uh, being separate. So, that's what I said, is that we have at least two references here. Okay, so what does the Holy Spirit do? Let's go to John chapter 16. Because I don't know about you, but if I were to say to you, so John chapter 16, uh, you know, my spirit strives with you. Um, there's more activity to, to just being with you. Uh, you and you're going to experience certain things that are, would be contradictory. Let me do it for instance. John chapter uh, 16, and again with verse 13. I know we just read that. Uh, the Bible says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. So therefore, the Holy Spirit needs to be intelligent to know you're in error to guide you into truth because you do not have to tell me the seventh day is the Sabbath when I already know it. So therefore, when I'm in error on something else, that's where I'll need guidance to come to the truth. Yes, I had uh, a, a mighty wrestling with the Holy Spirit when I went, attended the seminar that uh, over or about 30 years ago. I guess it is over 30 years ago. Wow, time flies. Um, nonetheless, w when I saw that the seventh day is the Sabbath, yes, I was guided by the Holy Spirit into truth, and I accepted the truth, and here I am. Praise the Lord. Let's go up to verse 8, John 16, verse 8. The Bible says, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of right uh, righteousness and of judgment. I don't know of a personality that can be a floating entity out there that can do reproving. These are all actions of an intelligent being. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's take a look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we have a number of verses to read here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 1, reading down to verse 11. Now concerning the spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. You know you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you the understanding that no man speak by the Spirit of God. And I have no problem with that. That can, God, as in the Father, is the one that is the person that sends the Holy Spirit. It is God uh, responsible. Uh, just like he sends his own son. 
calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is already working on our vocabulary. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but by but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. So even uh, the word Lord is interchangeable here. And there are diversities of operations, but the same God, which worketh all in all. Another uh, shared title. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given every man the prophet withal. For by one is given the Spirit of the word of wisdom. Why didn't it say God there if it's, in, if it's God's Spirit? Why, why, why do we have to say Spirit to confuse things? To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Why not the word God once again? To another faith by the same Spirit. It's the Spirit that's making these decisions is what I'm trying to bring out. So if you're wondering why I'm questioning it, uh, that's what I'm saying. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of the miracles. To another, prophecies, uh, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at the that one and the self-same spirit dividing to every man several as he will. And that closing verse there was very important. As he, the spirit, makes the decision, not God saying, uh, I'm going to breathe prophecy on this one, and I'm going to breathe tongues on that one, and I'm going to breathe uh, administrations on this one. No, he, the Holy Spirit came forth, sent of God, that is, not as a part of God, but he sends forth the Holy Spirit and says, please, uh, send the administrations. Uh, you'd give to every man what you believe happens to be beneficial for the church. And since they are all equal in thought and purpose and um, allowance and things like that, there, has, there does not need to be any communication necessary. Uh, the the so-called marching orders are there. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5 now. So that's what I wanted to show there is that the Spirit does the deciding. And I'm sorry, just something coming out of God's mouth or whatever, an intelligible force, that doesn't make sense, especially since all of us have some type of Spirit in us. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And so, <clears throat> that last verse again, we're going to walk according to what the Spirit is guiding us. Uh, that's an intelligence there, not just a force. Uh, God is not a, a being of force. That even contradicts God. God is not a being of force. Uh, and those that say, no, there is no third person, the Holy Spirit uh, is simply a force of God. I'm sorry, some, something that impresses me to make a decision, that's force. Someone showing me that is not a force. That's an intelligence. Let's go to Acts chapter 16, in which uh, it's out of sequence here, but evidently came to, to mind to be included in this list of verses. This is what the Holy Spirit does. 16.6 6 says, Now when they had gone throughout Perga, and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Wait a second. So going around preaching the word, preaching the word, and the Holy Spirit all of a sudden says, oh, stop. That's an intelligence. You're allowed to go here and there and there and there. No, nope, stop. It cannot just be some impression, if you would. That is not. That is an intelligence. And how about the Holy Spirit itself or himself as far as reactions? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. 
I mean, all of these verses have to, in one way or another, be ignored because some of these things are just so clear that there has to be more than just a force. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, the Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. If that's just God, or God, uh, a spirit, an entity, uh, uh, a force, uh, then why didn't it just say God? Don't grieve God. The extra words here clearly tells us that Yes, God is in per partnership, as in God the Father, in partnership with the Holy Spirit and takes full responsibility because they basically think the same things. If I, from my wife, am told to tell the children to clean up their rooms, uh, that, you know, getting ready for the Sabbath, make sure everything's in its place before the sunset, uh, and I... I go forth, we are one in mind. We are one in purpose. And so if they give me a hard time, they're not only going to grieve me, they'll even grieve my wife then. So, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. So the Holy Spirit can grieve. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's look here at verse 6. The Bible says here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. 6 and somewhere 1st Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6 here we go and ye become followers of us and the Lord having received the word in much affliction and joy of the Holy Ghost the Holy Ghost can experience joy there is no uh, uh, Holy Ghost of God here, even listed. And by the way, I know it's a little late to tell you this, but I'm not into, well, you see, the translators, uh, when they went and translated, they put in the, the Trinity into different places. So let me get this straight. Then I have to come to you to figure out what the scriptures actually say. I'm sorry, I got out of that. That was called Catholicism. So it's another form of Catholicism if I have to come to you and say, can you help me understand this verse? And you tell me, yeah, it's not written right. It's written this way instead. And you don't find it even in the new translations that way, let alone the old ones. It's only you know this, but none of us do. No, I take the word of God as it says. Yes, I have said that where we see the word God, it could actually mean Godhead. I'm making suggestions. You do not have to come to me to figure if it is or, or is not. You need to decide for yourself. But if I have to come to you to find out which verses did the pro-Trinitarians write purposely so that we would believe in a Trinitarian God, I'm sorry, I, I left uh, the Catholic Church. I'm not coming to a new Catholic Church. Uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 28. <clears throat> That's basically the anti-Trinitarian would actually be uh, Catholics of themselves. Okay, so Acts chapter 15, verse 28, the Bible says here, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. The Holy Ghost knows what's good and bad? See, that's what I'm saying. There are too many obvious verses here that show that there is an independence of the Holy Spirit that has full personality uh, as, as stated, as we are told. And the best rebuttal is, well, don't be reading anything past a, a, a certain date. Uh, you know, the, anything beyond 1888 is Ellen White's in error, where she says that the, uh, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit uh, is a personality, uh, the, uh, a person of, I shouldn't say personality, but is, has a full personality, um, but is a person, is the third person of the Godhead, is part of the trio, and all those things. All of that has to be error. Really, so I'm mean, again. I'm coming to you to find out what is inspired of God and what Ellen White was tricked into writing. 
no thank you. So, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 10 now. Hebrews chapter 10, we're coming to the close of this. Got a, one more question of uh, uh, yet now. Hebrews, that has lots of verses to answer. Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 15, the Bible says here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15, Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, da 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 da, uh, I just needed for you to know that the Holy Ghost can witness. I don't know of a force that can, you know, when God sends forth a force that it can actually witness. I, that doesn't make sense. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 23. Acts 20, 23. The Bible says here in Acts chapter 20, verse 23. Save the Holy Ghost, witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. So every city, it's being witnessed by the Holy Ghost. Um, doesn't make sense. That means that it's a separate entity because a force of God doesn't witness. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 5 now and take a look here at verse 3. Acts chapter 5 and verse 3. The Bible says here in Acts 5, uh, 3, But Peter saith, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So you can lie to the Holy Ghost. If it's just a force, that just goes one way. But if it has thought and abilities to discern and to give and to uh, witness... The Bible is clearly teaching that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is a separate being. In fact, here's the uh, about a dozen verses that shows that the Holy Spirit even speaks. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And then afterwards we have just a couple more verses. So yes, don't be accusing me again of um, like I said, just changing the number. Hebrews chapter 3, Godhead instead of the number 3. No, there's a big difference. And the difference uh, is the construct. And now I'm going to get to one more point then. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7. Wherefore the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts basically. So here we see the Holy Spirit speaking. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Not that I only have one more scripture. I'm just Something else just came to mind. 2 Corinthians. Let's take a look here. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The Bible says here, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So you can commune with the Holy Ghost. And notice that all three of them are listed there. And I did not go to the, what is it, First John 2, 7 or something like that. I'm not using that where the, it's listed there. Because uh, that is in dis dispute. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So I'll give you, give you a verse there, uh, anti-Trinitarians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. Chapter 12, verse 3 of 1 Corinthians. The Bible says here, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speak by, by the Spirit of God call, uh, calleth Jesus a curse, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. And why doesn't that say God the Father then? It's the Holy Ghost as a separate being. 
Uh, let's go to uh, chapter 2, verse 13 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 2. And let's take a, a look here at verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I even prayed in the prayer about that. So we have spiritual things being de, de, um, taught. The Holy Ghost can t teach. Let's go to Acts 28. So evidently I'm going backwards in my list. Acts chapter 28. Let's go there. In Acts chapter 28. And let's take a look here in verse 25. The Bible says, And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. The, again, the Holy Ghost can speak. Uh, let's go to Acts 13, verses 2 to 4. Acts 13. And 2 to 4. Acts 13, 2. As, he, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they have fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, not by God the Father, by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. So the Holy Ghost can actually send people. Let's go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Verse 12. The Bible says here in Luke 12, 12. Yeah, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you the same hour what ye ought to say. Again, the Holy Ghost teaches. Mark 13. Mark 13, verse 11. The Bible says here, But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do you premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Again, the Holy Ghost is the one that's going to be doing the speaking. By the way, what did Jesus pray for? Let's go to John chapter 14, coming to the end. John chapter 14. Let's take a look here. In John 14, verses 15 to 17, the Bible says here, if ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may be able to abide with you forever and ever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. The phrase, another comforter, means in addition to Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ is a comforter, which he is, that means the Holy Spirit is fully and completely the third person of the Godhead. Uh, let's go to verse 26. The Bible says here, But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. If, the, if Jesus was sent as a separate being, so is the Holy Ghost as the Comforter to do the teaching. Let's go to Acts chapter 9, verse 31. The Bible says here in Acts 9, 31. Acts 9 and verse 31. The Bible says here, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. There's the, the confirmation. Now, 
if the Holy Ghost was just simply Jesus or Jesus' spirit or God the Father's spirit, I have another quandrum, and that is what. Notice that there is a difference in these couple last scriptures here between the sinning against Jesus and sinning against the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And take a look here at verses 31 to 32. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So, if, if the Holy Spirit is Jesus, then all your sins are forgiven. Well, but we just were told that if you speak against the Holy Ghost, they're not forgiven. Okay, so then uh, if the, Jesus said the Holy Ghost are one, that means uh, for the Holy Ghost, if you speak against the Holy Ghost, you're speaking against Jesus, and it will not be forgiven. It, it contradicts the verse. One is forgiven, one is not. You speak against the Holy Ghost, not forgiven. And I'm not going to go into the whole detail of what that really is. But nonetheless, you are forgiven if you sin against Jesus, but you're not forgiven if you keep sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning until you totally cut off the Holy Spirit from you. Last verse, Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Acts 7. And verse 51, the Bible says here in Acts 7, verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in the hearts, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your Father did, so do ye. To resist uh, is, again, if it's just a force, there is no such thing as resisting. You're resisting the Father then, and it can't be that way. So obviously, I have established that there is clearly a, a separation between the Father. I'm sorry, between Jesus and the Holy Ghost. They cannot be the same by Scripture. How they can be the same is that they have one purpose, the same purpose for the salvation of the human race. They also have, uh, well, all the qualities, comforter, and th things like like that. Uh, they make up the Godhead as three separate beings, not one that the Catholic Church teaches. Um, it just, again, I, I believe it's, it's well established. There's too many contradictory scriptures. Don't give me all of that. Well, it says my spirit and uh, uh, things like that and uh, the spirit of God. And uh, Yes, it does. But sometimes it's not about the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it is no different than simply saying, look at my beloved son, my son. Okay? But I will tell you this much. If there is not three people to the Godhead, three beings to the Godhead, then why is Satan wasting his time? Because over in Revelation chapter 16, he sends three spirits all in competition with what God has. In other words, you don't counterfeit if there's only a two-person Godhead with the number three. You come up with a number two that is basically, I, I mean, you do have, by the way, you have God the Father and Satan, even though the controversy is between Christ and Satan. But you have Satan wanting God's throne. So that is the, the foe line up. You have Jesus Christ, which we are taught to follow his ways, and then you have Antichrist that is actively trying to get you to not follow Jesus Christ. And then you have the false prophet, which guides you into error instead of truth, the foe of the Holy Spirit. 
The fact that Satan is so active in counterfeiting a trio tells me that the trio, the three headed, the three Godhead people, beings, are in existence. They do exist. My apologies for this being for so long, but I'm afraid that if I had it two separate parts, people would give up, who knows, maybe after the first five minutes anyways. All I know is that it's very important to have the Holy Ghost convicting us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, and being guided into truth, even sealed, that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit, in truth, that we may be part of the 144,000 possibly, but at the very least, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Without the Holy Ghost, there is no possibility of heaven then. Again, a lot of it comes down to terms. How can God be one and pluralistic? Because you don't understand the definition of what really one applies to. It's not a single number because he says us and our. There's intelligence to the Holy Ghost, activities of the Holy Ghost that are independent. All of these things point to three. And that's what I believe. So to answer your question, my friend, what is my position? I'm actually against the Trinity because it carries an uh, along with it a negative aspect that is paganistic in itself. But there are three people, beings, that make up the Godhead. It's not just a matter of saying the word Godhead and not the word Trinity. Trinity, again, is one being that actually separates, but is all connected like having the same mind. Instead of the picture showing on the internet with three separate gods and say, you see, you're following uh, paganism, you're drawing it wrong you should actually have all of them joined at the head because that's what they do. They share one mind under the Catholic Church and they're just separate parts that actually perform the task that they are and then they finish the role. That is paganism. They are separate, distinct beings, all unified in purpose. God help us. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so very much for your scriptures. And I do pray that we would understand these things to the saving of our souls. Help us, I pray, to see clearly what Satan is trying to confuse. And he gets us either on one side or the other. Sure, our founding fathers wrestled this out. But I go by the one that declared to be a prophet or prophetess. And she wrote so much that declares, along with the Bible, because we prove things by the Bible, not by her writings, but the confirmation thereof tells us there are three beings to the Godhead. May each have an effect positively drawing us unto thee and may we all be gathered on the sea of glass. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.